Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first daily Vox Hangout of 2016. We're at the Oxfam offices in Bramfontein, and we're chatting to Oxfam SA about inequality in South Africa. In case you haven't noticed, we've taken on a partnership with Oxfam. We're running a few articles this week about inequality and how it relates to South Africa and the actual situation. So we're here with Aya Bonka Tawe. Did I get it right? Cool. Um, he's Oxfam's economic justice program manager. And Ayabonga is going to be chatting to us about the, the latest Oxfam report. It's called um, The Economy for the 1% and how it actually relates to us here in South Africa and what Oxfam actually does here in SA. So thank you for joining us, Ayabonga. Thank you. Ayabonga, sorry. Um, so basically to start off, what does Oxfam do in South Africa? As far as I remember, you guys are a charity or an aid organization. What kind of stuff are you guys doing now? So, so Oxfam is an international NGO um, that was started in, in Oxford in the UK, um, but which now is a confederation of um, a large number of, of um, organizations in the global north and in the global south. Mm -hmm. What Oxfam does in South Africa is um, a mix of sort of tangible capacity building and strengthening work mm -hmm. with uh, programs and also a mix of uh, public advocacy as well. So a lot of the work that we do rests on how we can influence um, particular kinds of policy discussions okay. with the intention of um, you know, creating a policy environment that speaks to the central core of our work, which is the eradication of poverty across the globe. Okay, so obviously inequality is a big deal for you guys. It's indeed. one of your, your biggest focus areas. Yeah, indeed. Okay. Um, and what do you do as Economic Justice Programs Manager at Oxfam? So as Economic Justice Programs Manager, I, I manage the aspects of the Oxfam Country Program that relate directly to economic justice, and that rests on three pillars. Um, the first of those pillars is around gendered impact of proper, uh, policies that relate to property relations in South Africa, and in particular, that speaks to the challenges that women have um, in accessing land rights in particular on the countryside. Then the second aspect of our work is around, um, you know, public policy advocacy and, and uh, movement building around tax and extractives, um, and in particular tax justice. Um, so it's, it's really looking at how the governance um, and issues of transparency and resource mobilization around the extractive sector have particular kinds of outcome, outcomes for communities and, uh, and workers in, in the extractive sector. Then the third part of our work um, is largely around supporting innovation um, and uh, conducting capacity building work and advocacy around climate justice. Um, and that involves strengthening innovations that have a social purpose, confined to some of the humanitarian work and the charity work that you've spoken about, but also to providing grants to, to similar organizations to do a range of the implementation work. Okay, that's really interesting. So let's chat about the Oxfam report that was released at the beginning of this week. It's called The Economy for the 1%. And without going into statistics, I'm not going to tell people how many billions of people are really, really badly off and how 62 people are really, really fantastically off. But um, Basically, the you know the gist of the report says that the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, inequality is getting worse globally, right? So how does that report actually relate to South Africa? We know we're one of the most unequal societies in the world. So how does that global report actually relate to us down here? So, so the report, as you said, is titled An Economy for the 1%. And I think it might be helpful to explain where sort of this language of 1% versus the 1996 yes. comes from. Um, you will remember that there was a large deal of community mobilization around um, sort of the fallout of the 2007-2008 mm. crisis. Wall um, yes, which led to, to the Occupy movement. Yeah. Um, and there was a sense at that point in time that the impact of that economic crisis, which was caused by sort of deregulated financial markets that were able to create sophisticated and complex derivative products mm -hmm. that no one really understood but had you know, the power and the potential to create unsaid economic vulnerability across the globe. So, so I think what has then happened since then is that 
there's been a greater focus, especially from organizations like Oxfam and indeed from policymakers around the questions of inequality. And I think what this report does, following on from the report that we conducted in 2014, the Even It Up report, yes. is that it hones in and focuses in on one aspect that we think is a major driver of inequality globally, yeah. which is the inability of many countries to prioritize their domestic resource mobilization issues because many of the multinational companies that work in those countries um, you know, have the incentive to actually um, sort of under-report much of their, much of their uh, income um, and also shift a lot of that income into sort of uh, commissions, and service charges and a range of other things offshore to some of their shelf companies and tax havens. Okay. And therefore the main message that's coming out of this uh, report is that tax havens are a focal point in our fight against inequality. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the key policy asks to say, can we come out of not only Davos, but actually come out of a range of other you know, global governance platforms that we're going to have in 2016 with a clear message on, on what it is that we're going to do to tax havens in order to address inequality in the global scale. So can you break it down for us? What is the issue with tax havens? Why are they such a bad thing? What are they, you know, how are they increasing inequality in, in the world? So, so one of the major challenges with tax havens is that the money that you would in, sort of um, in a scenario where you didn't have the tax havens that would accrue to the uh, receivers of revenue in the respective countries, mm -hmm. which would then be used for a range of social programs uh, that the government pursues in those countries, doesn't necessarily get to that fiscal. Okay. So you can already imagine that the, the then the fiscal space to do a range of the social programming that that leads to, to social investments that can um, reduce inequality isn't necessarily there. Um, the Mbeki report on illicit financial flows flagged this question of, um, of, of tax havens and base erosion and profit shifting as one of the major challenges of leakages out of the financial system on the continent. Okay. Now you can imagine, um, and one of, the, one of the statistics that we make in the report is that if you could account for all of the funds that leave the continent going to all of these tax havens, you would be able, if you had all of this money in the continent, you would be able to, to, to meet the healthcare needs of the African people, but also be able to ensure that every single African child who's going to school has a teacher to teach them. Mm. Now, you can already imagine that the opportunity cost of actually shipping this, a, a lot of this taxable income mm. to tax havens um, has a social impact and an implication on, on, on African society. Mm. So governments are basically worse off because individuals and companies are sort of shifting what would accrue to the government away from yes. the countries. Yeah. Okay, that does sound like quite a serious issue. Yeah. So you, you were speaking about Davos, which is the World Economic Forum, which is happening, started today mm -hmm. until the end of the week, I think, and President Zuma is there. Um, what are you hoping will come out of Davos? Is Oxfam engaging with any parties? Because I know it's a government and business sort of meeting. Yeah. Um, so is Oxfam playing any sort of role in, at that meeting, at the World Economic Forum, or do you just send recommendations through? How does that work? So just like, just like last year, Oxfam is, is chairing a few of the sessions at the, the World Economic Forum. Okay. But, what kind of sessions? Um, you know? So definitely sessions that, that speak to the challenge of inequality. Mm -hmm. um, you, you'll remember that the, the theme of, of, of this World Economic Forum is around achieving the fourth industrial revolution. Okay. So we would be interested as Oxfam to, to hear how some of the discussions around stemming industrial decline mm -hmm. and therefore creating more inclusive growth globally yeah. um, will also begin to confront some of the questions of inequality because we are acutely aware that the challenges of industrial decline and um, sort of the lack of investment in the real economy and the economy sectors of the economy that create jobs mm. is intimately tied to, to the challenges of financialization and what that has meant for the concentration of wealth at the top strata of society. Yeah. So you've seen, you know, uh, firms and multinationals with great periods of profitability mm. where you would have expected that there'd be a reinvestment of those okay. funds into the real economy to create jobs. Yeah. But we've seen, you know, those funds being invested. Yeah. In, the, in the financial services set and real estate. Oh. And that's created uh, certain kinds of um, sort of asset bubbles that have led to the financial um, instability that we saw in 2007, 2008. Okay. So definitely the theme of, of WEF this year mm -hmm. is linked to the questions of inequality. Mm -hmm. But I think for us, it's, it's about going there and making the explicit connections mm -hmm. between the issues. But I think we don't place um, all of our sort of eggs in one basket and say, you know, we place all of our hopes on WEF mm -hmm. to achieve this because our strategy has always been one of inside and outsider advocates. Okay. So, so we, we're still saying that the most important site for us 
is the discussion outside of, of the ski resort of Davos, okay. um, where a range of stakeholders across society are able to engage and have greater awareness around inequality. Um, with the intention of actually influencing policy change mm. that can lead to systemic um, outcomes that reduce inequality. Yeah. So, so for us, that's the focus. Yeah. yeah. That was going to be my next question: is whose job is it to actually try and reduce inequality? Because I feel like the rich are rich for a reason, right? They found a way to hang on to their money, and they're not going to give it away or, like you said, reinvest in social programs that you know that would help their their own countries when they can keep it all for themselves, right? And help themselves. So. Whose job is it? We can't expect the top, you know, the top layer and, and the richest to, to help the poorest necessarily. I feel like they can't connect, they can't relate to each other. So like you said, you mentioned stakeholders that you guys are engaging with. Who, who are some of those stakeholders? What kind of people and classes of people do you engage with or organizations or businesses to try and reduce in, um, inequality? Look, I mean, this is a global campaign that Oxfam has been running. Mm. Um, and tactically, I think one of the major reasons why we, we sort of identify the policy process as a key lever for systemic change. Yeah. Um, and policy you can imagine change yeah, at the top, right? they get changed at the top, yeah. but I think also in many instances we've seen across the globe that policies change due to a lot of resistance and expressions of popular discontent from below. Okay, so um, like activism and indeed, engagement. indeed. And 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 one of the things that we have said is that you know we we don't as communities outside of the business community mm. elect people that sit as shareholders that make decisions yeah. um, around corporate strategy and a range of other things. But what we do do is to elect the public officials that then create and lead that policy process. And what we are saying is that, you know, in as much as inequality is an economic issue, mm. I think the eradication of inequality is going to require a political process yeah. um, that's going to as we've already done here in South Africa, I mean, for the past 20 years, we've been speaking of the triple challenges of inequality, unemployment, and poverty. Okay. But I don't think we've, we've been able to say, what is the key systemic policy program that we would uh, propose to, to deal with the questions of inequality? Mm -hmm. Now, one of the ways in which we've already in the past begun to, to sort of um, achieve, try and achieve this kind of systemic change through policy is around the national minimum wage. Okay. We identify in the report that um, you know, a national minimum wage is one of the proven interventions that can deal with the challenge of income inequality. Yeah. Uh, you know, the experience from, from Latin America mm -hmm. and a range of other spaces, and even in the West, for instance, indicates that this is a proven intervention that's able to not only address inequality, but also deal with some of the challenges that we have now in South Africa mm -hmm. around boosting aggregate demand in order to achieve the goals that we want to achieve. Okay. So, so I think it's important that for us, that's a strategic entry point but there's a range of other interventions I mean securing land rights for women is an important one for okay. us um, ensuring that there's highly subsidized public access to public services is an important one yeah and I think that's a current issue especially for us because we locate you know the challenges and the struggles around free education mm. as part of that uh, highly subsidized model of, of, of the delivery of public services mm. and of course one of the major challenges that, that, that we have um, and this and this came out strongly in the Occupy movement, mm. is the relationship between the political process in our countries mm -hmm. and the role of businesses in campaign financing for political programs. Yeah. And one of the things that we, we, we are pushing for is to say, we're not going to deal with this demon of inequality without ensuring that there's transparency around the funding of political campaigns. Yeah. Because what we're seeing is that, you know, it's a classical problem of rent seeking, where those who are able or have pockets deep enough to fund political campaigns, mm -hmm have an inordinate influence on the policy process yeah. um, relative to those who don't have those deep That was what I was, was going to ask next week. How much of a role does corruption play? You know, even globally or, you know, sort of people getting into positions of power and using their wealth and influence to, to influence policy making and politics. Um, and do you guys have any ways to address that? So, so you mentioned how um, the African, you know, um, African billionaires or whatever, the richest 30% um, of Africans, if their money was actually funneled in back into Africa, you would be able to educate, what was it, 4 million children, I think it was? Um, well, you would deal with the challenge of, of, yeah. of, of stocking all of those schools, yes. that are educating up yes. teachers. But what schools. happens in, in those countries where corruption is a massive issue? So you've got that money, but the money is going straight into the wrong people's pockets. Does Oxfam sort of... Um, engage with those issues, or are you guys concentrating on the tax havens more um, and, and limiting the, the impacts of all of that? Like what businesses, how they funnel their money around? 
Look, I mean, definitely, I think for us, the, the issue is that that relationship between business mm -hmm. and politicians that are vying for public office yeah. is inherently a corrupt relationship. Um, and the reason why we say it is corrupt is that it gives those with deep pockets greater bargaining power and leverage mm -hmm. over our public officials than the people who are actually wait in queues to vote yes. for these public So essentially, it's, it's these those people's, people's priorities who take precedence over you know, the majority who actually need the support. Exactly, and we're saying that the only way that our public officials can actually prioritize mm -hmm. the people who don't have deep pockets mm -hmm. is if we're able to organize society okay. around a policy program and a policy proposal which says we need greater public financing or political campaigns, but we also need greater transparency. Yeah of some of the private donations that, that accrue to, to political organizations. Mm -hmm. So that tomorrow, if for instance, we have a big extractive company that is funding a, a political campaign of an organization which wins the election, mm -hmm. we are then able to see if policies then passed that yeah. is contrary to the campaign ticket that this organization came in with, mm -hmm. that now says, look, um, we think the policy direction we must follow is one that benefits one of our biggest funders. We're then able to, to identify some of those key connections. But at this point, we're sitting in a very dark hole because we don't know who funds which political yes. organizations yeah, exactly. to what tune and, 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 and all of those questions. Yeah. So I think for us, it's, it's that, that set of policy asks, mm -hmm. which is going to form, I think, the bedrock of our advocacy work around questions of inequality. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely, I think, by its nature, that is a, a project that requires a wide range of stakeholders to come to the table, yeah. not only from civil society, but also from the government and from the private sector as well. Yeah. Um, and certainly, we have begun to start some of those discussions around um, around how do we tackle this demon of inequality um, through achieving systemic change rather than sort of short-term band-aid solutions. Yeah. Often. How optimistic are you that this is going to happen? Look, I mean, this, the world we live in has, has uh, never been this unequal. Um, and I think much to sort of the chagrin of a lot of people who say inequality of some degree is always expected in the capitalist mm -hmm. system. We we at Oxfam are very optimistic that you can create a society where you, you reduce inequality. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an imperative because I think, you know, if we don't tackle this demon of inequality, mm -hmm. we'll never be able to achieve the kind of social cohesion that we think is required for the nation building project that we have in South Africa. Mm -hmm. What will happen though is that the more the status quo persists, mm -hmm. um, the greater the vulnerability of South Africa. Mm -hmm. to conflict that emanates from a range of other factors, be it ethnic conflict, be it economic conflict, which is uh, becoming a, a much greater discussion point for us here in South Africa. What do you mean by economic conflict? So by economic conflict, um, you know, I think there's one saying that captures it, which is that, you know, if the status quo persists, at some point the poor will only have the rich to eat. Okay. Um, and I think That's for us, I mean, that, that may be an exaggeration, mm -hmm. but I think we're already seeing if you look at what are the drivers of crime in South Africa, what are the drivers of, you know, a range, and in particular, very violent crime, mm. I think it's clear that inequity feeds into that. I mean, if I'm sitting in, in Alexandra and across the highway, you, see I, you know, there's a richest square mile on the continent, yeah. then, of course, for me sitting here, you know, in rat-infested Alexandra, mm. Um, creates a particular kind of um, kind of anger. No, no, kind of anger and yeah. kind of angst, right? Mm. Which says, you know, it cannot be correct that you live in a society where this kind of inequality happens. And I think the Alexander Santon example is, a, is, is, you know, is a great microcosm for that kind of, for that kind of issue. So, so I think if we don't address this challenge with the seriousness that it deserves, mm -hmm. then you know, we we bound to to really activate a ticking time bomb here, which which has the the ability to really shape the foundations upon which we are trying to build a new society. Yeah, and just why I think just to end off, sort of. Um, historically, obviously, you know, we've had great inequality just from systematic discrimination, apartheid, and stuff like that. So, how much of the inequality, obviously, you can't put a number to it, sure. but, you know, how much of the inequality in South Africa is related to the global inequality issue that Oxfam speaks about sure. in, the, in your report, and how much of it does stem from our historical background? Because we have a very specific historical background. I think it's a combination of both. Mm -hmm. um, so if I, if I can start, for instance, with our own historical background. Mm -hmm. Look, I mean, without a doubt, it's clear that our unique picture of inequality with its own particular features here in South Africa yeah. is an outcome of a system that, um, or an accumulation path in South Africa that is, was built on 
an experience of plunder, dispossession, um, violence, mm -hmm. um, and of course, all of the other things that are so all of the other ills that are associated with colonialism and apartheid mm -hmm. in South Africa. So therefore, it shouldn't surprise us that the people who are overly represented in the bottom decile in poverty in South Africa are black, mm -hmm. and the people that are overly represented in the one percent are predominantly white males, mm -hmm. because that's that is the accumulation part that South Africa has had, you know, since the discovery of gold here in Johannesburg. Yeah. Now, because as far back as that. Now, yeah. definitely, how that then sort of combines with the shifts that have happened since the the, the late 1970s, um, sort of the introduction of flexible exchange rates, the introduction of a globalized system of yeah. capital accumulation. Because we started so, fitting into the global economy. Exactly, and I think if you look at if you look at what that has meant for a country like South Africa, I mean, you know, the the global distribution of labor, in many instances, has assisted. Um, countries that are able to, at a low cost, produce um, for a massive scale, mm -hmm. right? However, it hasn't assisted countries like South Africa who are unable, at that low cost, to produce um, and also deal with some of the historic challenges around colonial wages and, the, and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. So now you're stuck in a position where some of the policy decisions that we made in the 1990s, in order for us to carve out a position for ourselves in this global economy, mm -hmm. I mean, I think of the trade liberalization, the financial liberalization yeah. that we saw in the 1990s, mm -hmm. and what the, the, that removal of tariffs um, and the protections for local industry meant for industries that were intensely employed as a woman, like the textile sector. Yeah. But that is meant for our agricultural sector. Yeah. So you can already see that this combination of the historic issues and the globalized economy, and our position in the globalized economy because of the policy decisions we made in the 1990s. Yeah. Those two factors combined, I think, give us this, this uh, picture of inequality as its outcome. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be interesting for us to see how we can begin to claw back some of that space. We definitely can't change the history, mm -hmm. but I think there are some kind of policy decisions that we, we must be able to review. And actually, if we're in a position to say, look, this no longer assists us, then we must be able to, to move out of those decisions. That has already happened with the bilateral investment treaties okay. and the review and cancellation of some of those treaties that happened last year. Okay. So I don't think we, we're in a spot where you know there's a rigid sort of globalized policy framework that we can't actually maneuver. Okay. Just on those bilateral treaties, what was the effect of those treaties? Did they just basically give the other countries that we had those agreements with more um, sort of advantages than we had because we were trying to get a foot in the door in the global economy? I mean, it would depend on, on, on the specific agreements because bilateral investment treaties, by their nature, mm. are treaties between two countries. Yeah. So, so it would depend on each country. So definitely, I mean, how you negotiate those treaties yeah. is, is, in many instances, a quick pro quo, right? Mm -hmm. So if I want my oranges to go into India, mm -hmm. I need to then allow, for instance, India to bring some of their yeah. finished manufacturing goods or textiles yeah. into the economy. Mm -hmm. What we haven't done is to say, in how we negotiate those treaties, is there a uniform way? of saying there are particular sectors that we wish to protect, oh. there are particular sectors that we feel yeah. we can, you know, um, sort of compromise on in yeah. order to be able to access markets. And mm -hmm. I think that kind of analysis of a selection of sectors that we think will be able to align, um, align to the socioeconomic objectives and imperatives that we have hasn't necessarily happened. Okay. And, and, we do, and we do think that this discussion of inequality should feed into that kind of discussion. Mm -hmm. So that's, those are the policy decisions that you're going to influence. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you so much for your time, Mario Bonga. Thank and you so much for taking the time to speak to Oh, it's always a pleasure. We love hearing, learning more things about, this, you know, everything that's happening in South Africa at the moment. Inequality, as you can see, is a huge issue. Um, so please follow our series of stories with Oxfam. Um, and tweet us. I forgot to mention this at the beginning, <laughs> but if you have, if you want to join the conversation, please tweet us at the Daily Vox at Oxfam SA and use the hashtag Even It Up because that's a conversation that we're trying to have in South Africa and hopefully in the rest of the world in, in time to come. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you everyone for tuning in and for periscoping as well. Um, and we'll catch up soon. Bye. <laughs>